Ken, thank you so much for your communion thoughts. It uh, ties in perfectly with what we're talking about this morning. In particular, I love the part where you said I had an hour for sermon, the sermon hours. That was awesome. We'll see what we can do on that. You did mention that we're going to be talking with Casey Thomason. Now, Casey, not everyone knows you. So tell us just a little bit about your family and all that, and then where you've been going to school and what's happening with your education kind of on that journey part. Then we'll get into Africa. Okay, well, I'm Casey Thomason. I'm from Meridianville. My parents are Mike and Cindy Thomason. I grew up here at Twickenham, and I've been at Auburn for the past three years. And this next year, I'm starting pharmacy school there. So. Okay. And I understand that if I try to cut off the interview, your dad's just going to cut off my microphone up there. So he'll just let you keep going. So, uh, Now, you, you came to our missions committee a few months ago with this idea and this opportunity to go to Africa. And we helped purchase the airline tickets for you to go. And then some other people helped with some of your spending money. So just tell us about what you were able to do over in Africa and kind of some of your experiences. Yeah, I was over there for a month, and the reason I went over there was to have an internship in the pharmacy at a clinic there that's located within one of the slums. And so I went over there, and I would spend my mornings in the pharmacy and help them out, and I learned a lot about the medications, and I, would, I was able to help them fill them and give them to the patients and explain to them how to take them. And I also tutored. Um, there was a school for orphans next door, and so I would tutor one of the girls in English, and I also helped with a support group for women who have HIV AIDS, and I was able to help provide them with Bibles and explain how to study their Bible and how they can share the gospel with others with their Bible. And I also did house visits for people that have HIV AIDS and to go into their homes and pray with them. Okay, now, for the first part of the trip, you're part of a team with other people around you. Right. But the majority of the time, it's just you. How was that? Um, it was different. There's normally, there's um, a missionary couple there and also a nurse, but they took this time to travel a lot. So a lot of days I was the only white person around. And um, it was really fun getting to know like their culture and like all the different things that they do. Like they don't really have silverware that much so you get to eat with your hands, which is fun. And um, just getting to know them. And I obviously stood out a lot as I was walking through the slum. Um, Mzungu means white person in Swahili, and everyone's like, oh, Mzungu, Mzungu, hey, how are you? And <laughs> went and shook everyone's hands. I kind of felt like a celebrity. It was cool. I just wave as I walk through. But <laughs> uh, Next week's lesson is on humility, so it's going to be great. <laughs> okay. now, now, obviously, you're put in situations that you haven't experienced before, not just going from the first world to the third world but also into situations, uh, especially working with the HIV patients, what, what was that like to get outside your comfort zone? Um, well, I didn't know too much about it, and one of the first days I was there with the group, because the group I went with sponsors the clinic, and so we got a tour of the clinic, and they explained just like the situation with HIV, and there was so much I didn't realize, like many of them, there's a stigma in the community, so if you're HIV positive, a lot of times you're like shunned by society, and just that part is huge, and that's why a lot of them have trouble getting um, access to food and things like that, and so in one of the first days, we would go into their homes and pray with them, and so it was just kind of like diving right into it, and it was, it was hard, and it just saw the need immediately, but it gave me something where I'm like, okay, now how can I pray for this? How can I help them? Okay, now a lot of mission efforts do one or the other. They either are meeting physical needs or they try to go in and provide just the spiritual needs. How did it help trying to do both as working with you know, your, your nursing training and your pharmacy training and all of that, but then also pairing that with the faith that you received from your parents and this congregation and what the Lord's been doing in your heart? Yeah, um, I definitely like... My f number one job I want to be is a missionary, and my second is a pharmacist. And so I would love to use pharmacy as a way to reach people. And so they gave me a passion to help the gospel spread through the people that came to the clinic. And so I got to know those women. Um, the support group was with the outreach team at the clinic. And so I was able to know people to reach out to through pharmacy and kind of understand what they were going through with learning about HIV. And so it's mainly like I'm a pharmacist and can help in that, and that gives me a way to know the people in the community in order to go and share the gospel with them. 
Okay, we've been talking some this summer about removing some of the scaffolding, the, thing that we, the things that we lean upon for security and encouragement and that type of thing. So you don't have a car. Uh, you have limited access to computers and that type of thing. How did that affect your faith? Of, because you're putting it in a very difficult situation without the normal things that we rely upon, even you know, comfort foods and that type of thing. How did that help your faith grow during this month? Well, when everything else is taken away, you still have the Lord. And so it really, like, I know the first couple of days I was there, it's like I didn't know anyone. I went with no one I knew to a country I've never been to, a continent, a continent that I've never been to. So it was just, in that time, it's like I need the Lord. And so it, you just go to your Bible and go to prayer, and it just points you in that direction. And so it was hard, but it causes you to rely on the Lord more and trust on him. And I told you before you left that you were going to grow tremendously during this month. Is that really what happened? Yes, very much so. And, like, I know that the Lord had been calling me to go to Kenya for a few years, and now it's like, okay, now I see their needs and what they need. And just, it's been great for that. And just, I know that the Lord will continue showing me where I need to do, like, where I need to go, what I need to do in my time here as well as my time there, because I do hope to go back. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure it's just going to, when you're reading stories about over there and now you have faces to put with it, it's just an incredible experience for you. Yes. Thank you for taking time to share with us. Let's show our appreciation. <laughs> Definitely, if we have um, one of our own that wants to be a part of what God's coming to do, we want financially do everything we can to, to make it happen. In her latest book, Daring Greatly, University of Houston professor uh, Bryn Brown explored how today's workplace often produces this burden of not getting enough done. So even though you can, you can look at your smartphone and, and uh, respond to an email at 3 in the morning, and you can even feel the call on your day off, you still feel like you're getting behind, don't you? And it's kind of what's happening. And Brown uh, attributes this anxiety to two things. One is the availability of technology, and the second is just kind of unreal expectations that are put out in today's economic society and, and the things that are happening and the realities that are there. So you've got laptops and you've got smartphones that allow you to take your work just about anywhere. And then you've also got employers in the downsized workforce that are asking their employees to take on the jobs of of two and three people in, in a full workforce. And so all these things are, are happening that are, are kind of putting expectations at a much higher level on what can get done and how well you can do it. Sometimes they're beyond human reason. Brown says this, there's no stopping and celebrating or acknowledging the accomplishment of anything. Instead of feeling pride or recognition, you simply say, shoo, now I can go on to the next thing on my list. And on it goes. So that's kind of the environment that we find ourselves in, and it's kind of this treadmill. And we know we need to set up boundaries, boundaries for our work and the things that we do, so that we can be fully engaged and be there in, in, in holy present in the lives of our family and friends. And so we say things like, oh, okay, family, I'm, I'm going to put the phone down, and past 9 o'clock, I'm not, I'm not going to look at emails, I'm not going to take any calls. 15 minutes later, you find yourself picking up again. Because you, you fear, you're fearful. You're fearful that you're the only one on the team at work that will be perceived as inaccessible or uncommitted. And so you drop those boundaries. For others, we, we work for another reason. It just seems it's hard to turn off our machines because we're afraid that we're going to miss something. That something's going to happen. Didn't you hear about something? No, I, I didn't. I was kind of checked out. The other reason is we kind of fear that we won't be missed that would be perceived as, as not relevant or not needed or not essential. And so we buy into this culture of immediacy and this 24-hour availability so that we can be accessed at any time. Because it's really something within us that says we want to be needed. We need to be needed. And so it leaves us frantic and hurried. It's not just in adults. I know a lot of teenagers that after a full day of school go work at a part-time job or some after-school activity, they roll in 8, 9 o'clock, and they got four to five hours of homework. So after a quick dinner, they're off doing that. And sometimes they don't go to bed until after 1 o'clock in the morning, and then they got to get up and do it all over again. 
And so we find ourselves falling into this idea that we don't know who we are and how to judge who we are without the productivity as a metric of our worth. Philip Yancey says this, work has become for Christians the only sanctioned addiction. Isn't that true? And for some, we wear it like a bad honor. You, you bet, I'm dedicated to work. And it, it's not just that I'm working for man, I'm, I'm working for God. And so we spiritualize how busy we've become. And these feelings of, of being behind and needing to do more aren't limited to the workforce. It's just pervasive in everything that's out there. And it used to be that people would ask you know, in the hallway, hey, how you doing? And the standard response was fine. Now the standard response of fine has been replaced with busy. And, oh yeah, I'm busy too. And so friends exchange kind of the litany of activities and, and things that they got on that just keeps them running and gunning. For some people though, we're busy by design. We choose to live this lifestyle because we want to be so out front in our lives and our days that the big questions of life as to who we are and who God's calling us to be can't catch up with us. See, we'd rather run it at this frantic pace of work and volunteering and being involved in our kids' activities that we don't have time to sit on the back porch to really allow these realities to catch up with us, to slow down enough to spend time with God, allow Him to speak into our heart. You know, we'd rather fall into bed exhausted at night. The reason we'd rather do that, then we don't want the realities of being disconnected from our spouse, trouble with, with our kids, or even estrangement from God to keep us up at night. So we'd rather fall in bed just completely exhausted. How many of you love those, those walkways at the airport? You know what I'm talking about? The ones that go real fast? And I, I don't know about you, how many of y'all just stand on it and walk? I mean, just stand there. And how many of you kind of walk like the, beyond, the, the bionic man? You, you just kind of cruising? You kind of looking across? And you, you, you're like, I'm, I'm going at least 25. And you're laughing at the people who are just kind of walking beside. But when you're kind of looking at them, you got to watch because you know that walkway ends, right? And then there's that awkward moment at the end where you kind of catch yourself. You don't watch it. You, you'll do a dive roll. And so you're going at this fast pace and all of a sudden you slow down. And it's this uneasy feeling. A lot of us feel that way. Sometimes the first day on vacation, where you've been running and gunning something, you, you sit down and you're like, wow, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to have conversations and, unless you know, my kids are in the back seat or, or my wife's on, on a quick cell phone. She's right here. And so there's this uneasy feeling, and a lot of us don't like that. So we hop back on the, the walkway again. We need to realize that a lot of our lives are getting away from us when we're on this quick walkway. What's the solution? And, and I know for me, sometimes I have to pull back and, I, you know, I, I have to rest and I have to play and I have to, within me, I have to let go of exhaustion as a status symbol. Yeah? I also have to stop time productivity and self-worth. What I'm able to accomplish is and, and point that out. You know, we have to find ways to disengage. Disengage from time to time. As we talked about two weeks ago, of, of making sure those big rocks make it into the containers of our life. And that we're utilizing time in a way that makes sense. That we're, when we look back on our life, we don't have regrets. That we put in those things that are essential in there first. Well, believe it or not, this desire to work seven days a week and to keep up with those around us it's not a new idea. In fact, it was there from the very beginning of time. So God puts in a solution for us, and that is Sabbath. That was his solution. Well, we've heard about Sabbath in the Old Testament, haven't we? We've heard about all these different things that you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And then you, you turn over to the pages of the New Testament, and we, we kind of cheer as Jesus breaks all these rules of Sabbath. You're like, okay, it's kind of confusing. God says to do it, but then Jesus is like breaking all this stuff. And, and so there's this thing where we're like, are we supposed to be doing this? What's our response? Well, we know from Nehemiah chapter 13 that observance of Sabbath was from sundown on the sixth day until sundown on the seventh day. But is there anyone besides the Jewish people that are still following this discipline? Well, what I want us to look at this morning is three purposes in our life 
for observing Sabbath, if you choose to discipline. In Sabbath, we, first, we remember God, our Creator, and our Deliverer. Secondly, we experience God as our sanctifier. And finally, we anticipate God as our provider. Okay, we're going to break, go through each one of these. First, is to remember God, our Creator, and Deliverer. You know, most people observe Sabbath, regard it as an institution that was put in place so God's people would be different and this perpetual covenant for His people. And really it pointed to a sign of two events. The first being the day in which God rested after completing creation in Genesis chapter 2, and also the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt. So these two events in the lives of Jewish people and God's holy people, those were huge. And so it was a time to step back and remember what God had done for them. And so the first list of the Ten Commandments occurs in Exodus chapter 20, and it ties observance to the Sabbath in with God's creation. So let's read this together. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and all your, do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So what he's saying here is, this resting on the seventh day is not a punitive thing. It's not a penalty where you've got to do time out for a day. It's a blessing. It says, follow the pattern of God. Even our Heavenly Father in creation worked feverishly for, for six days, but then took the seventh day off and made it a time of reflection, of holiness. And so he becomes this source of all holy things. And so at the core of creation, it's this invitation to rest. Pretty cool. But it, it's not just to relax, but to slow down. Step off of the fast-moving walkway and reflect and remember Elohim, the God, our Creator, the source of this holy day. So that's what it was all about. Well, the, the second time that the Ten Commandments are listed, we, we find this in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, and this time the focus is on Moshia, the God who delivers. And so Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15 says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe this Sabbath day. And so Sabbath is, is rooted in this Exodus memory. And so it, it's, it's a painful time for 400 years where they've been enslaved. And they, they've been calling on deliver. And finally, Yahweh shows up. And so the, the conduct of Yahweh and his expectations on the seventh day is in sharp contrast to the expectations that Pharaoh had for his people. Because he, in Pharaoh's brickyard, human life was expendable. It just wasn't all that big a deal. Because you were what you produced. And if you fell down and died from exhaustion, pull the body off, throw a little sand over it, and put someone else in that spot. And so he says, no, you're to be cherished. You're my holy people. I want to give you this day of rest. Can you imagine how incredible it must have been? But people, you mean we really get a day off? Yes. That's what I want you to do. So God was calling his people, people then as they're made their way into the promised land. He's like, I know that it's been 40 years since you've lived under this way. If you're going to go, go into the promised land, where you're going to be working for yourselves. And there's going to be this tendency to go back to working seven days a week, but I want you to be different. I want you to remember me, remember what I've done. He's telling them that for 400 years, you're forced to work seven days a week. Why would you now do it by choice? Your life should know a limit to such activity. And by limiting it, it's going to allow you to look to me and remember Remember not only the creation, but also in this deliverance in the Exodus. So acknowledging that God is doing this, just as, as Ken mentioned, becomes who we are. It's our identity. And, and, and we, we claim these realities, but this is a time for us to step back and say, oh yeah, and it's going to inform what we do the other six days. And so it's time we set aside, set aside as holy before God to remember it. Well, the second thing the Sabbath will allow us to do is to experience 
God our sanctifier. And that's really what the core of this, this message series has been about, is allowing God to make us holy. And this is a biggie. Sabbath is not just remembering what God's done for us in the past, but what he continues to do for us in the present. So we're not talking about our salvation. We're talking about this being made holy. Exodus 31 and 13 says this. Say this to the Israelites. You must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord. Then these words, who makes you holy? It's not something we do. It's what we allow God to do to us. We have to be in his presence for that to happen. You know, our sanctification being shaped in the image of Christ includes not just forgiveness, but it's also a time of healing. It's a time for uh, taking a step back from the sin that has ravished us throughout the week and say, uh, I need to be reshaped into your image. Lord, fill in those gaps. And so this God that created us in this time of Sabbath, then he can recreate us. He can restore us. So God simply can shape us and mold us and make us. But we have to sit down for him for that to take place. You know, a day where we park the car, a day where we turn off the television set, a day when we resist running to Home Depot to do some home improvement project, it creates space, space for God to do his thing in our life. You know, observing the Sabbath, whatever that looks like for you, is an acknowledgement that only God the creator has the power to recreate us into the thing that's new. You know, we, we sing that song, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me? When's that supposed to take place? I mean, we talked about being in God's presence and creating this new heart in us. I mean, do we need to add the line uh, as I wait in line at Krispy Kreme? I mean, it's, it's just, our lives are so hectic. And so we, we talk about creating this heart and being in God's presence, but we don't, have, we don't set any time away from that. We're just going and doing all these different things. Walter Brueggemann says this, the sabbatic principle holds that on a regular basis, the rhythms of life, of faith, require cessation of all activities as an act of acknowledging the rule of Yahweh and handing over one's life back to Yahweh in gratitude. That's what Sabbath is. It's a discipline. It's saying, God, I, I know I profess through my lips that you're my number one. Now I want to show you. I, I'm going to give you an entire day, Lord, just to hand it over to you. And Lord, you do within me what you'd have your will to be. But somehow it, it kind of loses this punch. I want to create this thing within me. And Lord, I'm going to be completely yours from 10 o'clock to 11.15, most Sundays, unless we're on vacation or I'm down at an Auburn game. You know, it just... It, somehow we create such, we carve out such a limited amount of time for God to do his work. So Sabbath is a discipline to remind us that not only by faith in our creator and his healing work, but also in this sanctification process that takes place. Finally, Sabbath helps us to look forward. It's an anticipation of God as our provider. I spent a little time in Hebrews chapter 4 this week, and verse 1 says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands for all of us, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Skipping down to verse 9. There remains in a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. This passage, what the Hebrew writer is, is describing is, is kind of a, a type or a, a taste of future glory of this eternal rest that we believe that God, our provider, is going to give to us. He said, Sabbath is it's just a nibble. It's an appetizer. It's coming into God's presence in a limited amount of time as we get ready for for this to take place. And this Sabbath-like rest, the Greek is Sabbatismo, where the children of Israel marched into the land of Canaan. It says that they failed. 
they had this opportunity that in the land flowing with milk and honey to say, it's not us, it's a God thing. Instead, they kept working seven days a week saying, look at what all we've been doing. Scripture reminds them, those vineyards you didn't plant. You didn't pull the rocks out of those fields. This was all given to you as a gift. And show people it's a gift by taking a day off. So the people come in and say, why is everyone around? Why aren't there people in the fields? Why is the market shut down? It's an acknowledgement. All this is not from us. It's from God. He said the people failed to do this. Hebrew writers tell us, don't make the same mistake. You've got to carve out time. Those who maintain their faith in Christ may begin to enjoy this promised rest provided by God even in this life as they prepare to enter it fully in the life to come. So we acknowledge not only God, but we show that we're anticipating, we're looking forward to this world to come. And our life is reflective of that. So in Sabbath, we remember what God has done for us in the past. We celebrate what he's doing for us right now in this sanctification process. And we point to the future that God holds for us. I'm going to invite Kelvin and Nancy to come up. Kelvin and Nancy are part of our small group ministry. And they're, they come over to our house. And we all got around and came up with these different disciplines. And I asked for someone, would you be willing to practice this discipline of Sabbath. And Nancy's uh, hand went up immediately, and Kelvin said, well, I guess we're doing Sabbath, so. Come on up, you guys have a seat. And so, first off, I, I want you to, to tell us um, what you did, and then I want you to describe a little bit, because it didn't happen immediately, did it, Kelvin? No. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so you guys kind of talk about you had all these grand plans, and you can tell them what you did, but then also share, because I don't want everyone to think that disciplines are just an easy thing, and oh yeah, we'll just do this. So kind of get, get a story, then Nancy, kind of tell us more about what you did and how it impacted you, okay? Okay, so the first, um, we had about four or five different disciplines to choose from, so me and Nancy decided to go with the Sabbath. Um, keep in mind that you're going to you can't do, uh, watch any kind of television. If you do, it has to be spiritually related. Um, of course, you can't labor or do anything, and I'm growing a garden right now, so that was a difficult process for me. Um, so basically, we were supposed to start on the 17th of May. We ended up starting on June the 14th. Um, <laughs> okay, so a month. <laughs> yeah. A month. So a month. It was, but, but, but you guys had some family come in and everything else? So. Yeah, the, the 17th, um, we said, okay, let's start on the 24th. On the 24th, my daughter and my grandson came to visit, so that kind of threw us off track then. Um, we put it off to the 31st. On the 31st, um, let's see, what did we do on the 31st? Uh, oh, uh, we actually had a date night or a date evening, so Brad and Jill kept Jackson for us, so we did that. So then we said, okay, we'll put it off again to the next week, which so is- So blame it on us. Yeah, blame yeah, it on you. Yeah, it's good. Yep. Which was the 7th. So on the 7th, um, I think we just didn't even mention it at all to each other and just blew it off to the 14th. So the 14th was KJ's birthday. So we said, let's go ahead and start. Okay, ironically, the Potts invited us over to, gen uh, to dinner at their house um, with the uh, Johnsons. So dinner at anybody's house, I'm not going to turn that down. So we went to dinner, and we were disciplined enough to say, okay, let's get back before sunset, and let's start it. So we did, and we actually started it that Friday. Okay, so kind of share a little bit, Nancy, about what you guys did and how you filled that time, because you went sun up, I mean sundown to sundown, and you guys did this for four weeks, is that right? Okay, kind of share, uh, give, give people access into your home as to what Sabbath looked like for the Malones. I think it is. Oh, okay. Um, oh, yep. Okay. Um, well, the first night that we did it, I think I was kind of in shock because with Jackson, on the weekends, I'm so busy doing stuff. You know, you just want to do stuff. You want to take him to the store and get him this, or we have to go shopping, or, you know, just things that we can't do all week because we're working in daycare and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, when we come home, too, it's even a routine, you know, bath and, you know, and then bed and... So when the weekend came, um, I think the reason why it was put off is so much is because 
you didn't want to discipline yourself to do it. Okay. You know, you didn't want to discipline yourself to put aside the things that you normally do. And so the first weekend for me was a little difficult. But um, when we did the next weekend and we had KJ home from Impact and Kelvin's oldest son over, I think is when that night is what really, you know, put all of my selfishness aside and realized how much God was talking to me and, and letting me know, you know, it's not only a time to realize who you are, but realize who you need to be and where you need to be and to talk to your family more and see where they are, you know. Um, and so that was a wonderful study that we had together um, to talk to each other and to talk to each other and for me and Kelvin as the adults to um, talk to the children more, you know, about God. And you were most worried about Jackson and how he would, you know, not have the TV on and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But you filled that with game time and some other things. So just kind of share a little bit about how he reacted to this. Yeah, I, Jackson alone is, is such a blessing to me. He's such a good baby, and God has just been so wonderful to, to us. Um, but Jackson, he can do things on his own. He doesn't really need the TV to distract him. Um, he's got KJ playing with him. We've gotten a new puppy um, playing with him. So, um, and even when he went to bed, usually we will watch Sprout for a little while with him mm -hmm. to wind him down. But he was good. We read books together, and we just were able to spend more quality time with him, too. You know, during the week he's at daycare. Um, and you said you wanted to know a little bit more about what we did. Um, we went to the park on Saturday. Um, and we knew that um, going out would give him some time to release some energy, but also it's to enjoy God's creation too. Yeah. You know, being out in nature, seeing the birds and the trees and just the wonderfulness um, of, of God. And we went to the mountains one weekend as well. Um, so we did some things to occupy time that we knew would be uh, pleasing to God. Um, during this time, and you know, and studied and things like that. So we didn't stay cooped up in the house. We did yeah. go out, and we, but we didn't go out to eat or anything like that. But we did go out to the parks and stuff Spend. like that. So. Let me yeah. piggyback on that real quick. Um, Jackson's normal routine on Saturdays or every morning is pretty much milk, breakfast, and then we'll watch Sprout together. So what we did that Sabbath that we started, I don't know how he knew this, but. We went downstairs instead of watching Sprout and just did some playing around with his toys and reading. I was kind of tired, so he actually let me get a nap in while he was just <laughs> running around, playing by himself, so content, and I was just amazed that he was able to do that. At the same time, when we went to, the, to Big Spring Park, we, uh, I'm normally about to turn on some music. I was getting ready to listen to some Jackson 5, old school 70s Jackson 5. So as I got ready to turn it on, um, Nancy goes, you, you know you can't listen to that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right, I forgot. So, okay, so we turned it to 90.1 FM, which is a gospel station, a radio station. So um, Nancy was just talking about how she wasn't really getting much out of this Sabbath discipline, so, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like I really got anything out of it. So there was a sermon on, and this pastor was talking about how he, has, he had visioned or a dream often that he was on trial, and Jesus was his defense attorney, the devil was the prosecuting attorney, God was the judge, and he was on trial. So when it came time for the prosecution to present their case, the devil had talked about this pastor has cheated, deceited people, and he's lied often throughout, throughout his life. So when the judge, the Lord, turned to ask him, how do you plead, he said, I didn't want to say guilty because I was afraid of the punishment. I didn't want to say not guilty because what the devil was saying about me is actually true. So he turned to his defense attorney, Jesus, and the Lord and Jesus said, plead the blood. So he said, so when he said, so when he said, I plead the blood, that basically washed all of his sins away for Jesus dying for him 2,000 years ago. And in this way, he was able to be, you know, redeemed of his prosecution. 
And the one thing that I thought about that is, is there's no way on earth we would have listened to that if we weren't practicing the Sabbath discipline. So that was just one of the, you know, many fruitful things that we got out of it. Okay, so you're messing up your routine. You're getting out of the flow of life. Did that help to create this space for God to, to kind of work in your life? Yes, absolutely. We got some great studying done. We had a bunch of spiritual publications that were just packed away from when we moved from the apartment to the house. And we were able to bring out some of those and get some good reading in. Um, one of the Seventh Day of Venice, and we actually went to Oakwood uh, University's uh, church, me, KJ, and Jalen, and Jackson, so me and the boys. And that was actually a great experience as well. But um, one of the things that <clears throat> we were able to get from that is uh, we read a publication that was called The National Sunday Law and the Beast, the Dragon, and the Woman. And basically, there are Seventh-day Adventist um, publications that the National Sunday Law is basically in the short story. It tells that, you know, the government is going to, at one point, make it to where Sunday is like the Sabbath instead of Saturday being the Sabbath. So, right. but... Um, the Beast, the Dragon, and the Woman is just like a prophecy um, breakdown um, from Revelations and Daniel. So I was able to get some good reading and some understanding out of that. But the thing about it was is, is that we ended up dedicating, um, Nancy actually came up with this, that after the Sabbath practice was over with, we would in turn take time out every Friday. We first started with like one or two hours, and then we didn't put a time limit on it. And we basically will take this time as a family to study. And one of the things that I wanted to point out about KJ, he was actually at the Hortons for the third Sabbath, I think. And, oh no, the last one, the fourth one. And he was able to be away at another person's house, you know, one of our church members, of course, but still practice his discipline while they had their lives going on. Going on. I thought that was real impressive that he was able to do that. Nancy, would you recommend this for other people to give it a try? Um... Yeah, I definitely would from the aspect of if your life is so busy like ours and you have, you know, a kid in sport or even a young kid and, you know, like Kelvin's and I schedules, uh, work schedules, um, you know, I work 8 to 5 and he works 10 to 7. So, you know, our schedules are so different that we don't really get to spend a whole lot of time together. And as far as studying. And so um, I definitely recommend it um, if you want to draw yourself closer to your kids and draw yourself closer to each other. And, you know, now that KJ's going into, you know, high school, it's really important that we stay close to him and, and remind him every day um, that God is with him. And um, like even right now, we're studying the personality traits of being a Christian. And I think that's really important, not for, not only for him, but for our for me and Kelvin to, you know, step back and say, hey, am I doing these things too? And am I really being a good exa example? Yeah. So for that part of it, um, and also being able to, you know, spend more time with God, of course, I definitely recommend it. Thank you guys for sharing. Let's show more appreciation. <laughs> Hopefully these testimonies are helping because it doesn't do us a whole lot of good just to talk about these things unless we're willing to put them into practice. The Sabbath is designed to remind us of the truth about who God is and the basis of our trust we have in Him. But I, it, please do not misunderstand this. It's not a test of obedience that you're obedient if you do these things and you're not if you don't. Sabbath was intended to be a blessing, to be a gift Remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was designed to help us, to allow us time to be shaped. More than anything else, to remind us of the faith that we, that we claim. But please don't look at this discipline or anyone that we've talked about as a way of, of saying, I'm more spiritual than you if I participate in these things. We're simply trying to grow in our faith. We're, we're, try, we're, we're trying to do something besides just saying, well, I, I want to get better. We're training to get better. We're trying to become more like Jesus by utilizing the tools of Jesus and dying to ourselves. So I, I hope each of us can, can take a few moments to step off the treadmill of work and our, even our, our times of volunteering and activities.
and live life differently than the world around us. I hope we'll take the opportunity and perhaps choose this discipline of giving him sundown to sundown. As I promise, your life will be blessed. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes we look at some of these things and, Lord, it, it bothers us because we, we don't want to do anything to try to earn our salvation. And certainly that's not what we're talking about. But, Lord, we know that our salvation was granted through the work of your son Jesus on the cross. But, Lord, we don't want to stay infants in Christ. We want to grow. We want to mature. We want to become more like him. And, Lord, sometimes just, just trying and, and having that desire isn't enough. Help us to train. Help us to carve out uh, time. Help us carve out space so that you can do your work within us. Lord, help us to crave to be more like you. In his name we pray. Amen.